Hi, hello again. Welcome on my scientific blog and my scientific YouTube channel, Discover Social Sciences. Mm, uh, before I pass into the subject matter of this specific update on my blog, a few words of introduction. Uh, so first of all, uh, a specific introduction, which is like pertinent to this update and maybe a few consecutive ones. I have entered a phase in my work uh, when like many things go on in the same time. Mm. Uh, I know this is summer, this is summer holidays and me, an academic teacher, normally I should uh, be enjoying my holidays, but the situation is a little bit unusual uh, because at the university we essentially assume that due to the pandemic, due to the epidemic risk, uh, starting, from the, uh, st uh, starting from October, we go as much online, as much distance learning as possible. Or at least we need to prepare for going online as much as possible, because that epidemic curve can spike like any moment. Uh, so I devote summer to preparing uh, both uh, some scientific writing, some books and articles, and to prepare a lot of new content for my students, for like the new academic year of teaching. Uh, my point is that in those updates which are coming now on my blog, I am experimenting a little bit with new formats. I want to find a format uh, of content which will be both attractive and sort of flexible and smoothly working from my point of view. Okay, So you can see some experimenting if those experiments don't quite work. For example, if a visual component is not exactly what it should be, or if the uh, or if the sound if the audio recording sucks, please forgive me. It is just me experimenting with those technologies. Uh, now, a uh, general introduction as usually uh, below me in the video window. You can see those letters discoversocialsciences.com. This is the uh, and this is the address of my scientific blog Discover Social Sciences. So when you go to the description box below the video, you can see this specific link, discoversocialsciences.com. You click on that link and it takes you to the website of my blog, Discover Social Sciences, where you can find an update which has the same title as this video. Uh, and this is how those uh, video editorials are coupled with uh, written updates on my blog. Okay, that's uh, that would be all in terms of introduction. So now I will go into the subject matter of this update or as a matter of fact into many subject matters of that update. And this is precisely the format that I am experimenting with now. Uh, from each written update on my blog, I make a PowerPoint presentation, which then I convert into a PDF. And as I am speaking on those video updates, I sort of scroll through that PDF. So here you have research log July 5th, 2020. This is how I... Um, these are like the working titles I give to each of my updates. Huh? Okay, so we move forward. I essentially recapitulate or I combine two threads in my, in, in my work, my research and my writing on cities and on the, civilization, I, uh, on the civilizational role of cities on the one hand and teaching on the other hand. And here you have a reminder of like a central thought which sort of permeates or weaves through all my research on cities. It is a thought which I had when I was cycling through the almost completely empty city in the beginnings of the COVID-19 related lockdown. And the thought is the following. How many f human footsteps per day 
does this place need to be truly alive? Precisely when I saw how dead, how, let's say, how lethargic a city can be in lockdown, I realized how important are human interactions uh, when it comes to keeping a city truly alive. So here is like a big point uh, of uh, my research on cities. Cities are essentially demographic anomalies. This is something that emerges both from the literature I studied and from the current empirical data I am passing in a review. Uh, essentially, if you observe the surface of our planet from the orbit, if you take satellite photos of Earth, cities present themselves as abnormal agglomerations of human structures. And the interesting fact, which, which essentially I, sti I'm, I am still working on nailing down uh, like for sure, is that the total surface of urban land on Earth tends to be quite stable on the long run. We extend the total surface of our cities on the planet very slowly. And usually what takes place when one city, one big city expands in one place of the planet, other cities tend to collapse or to disappear completely in other places. It is intriguing. It is one of the manifestations of what I call collective intelligence in human societies. And this is precisely another little obsession of mine. Let me center it. Yes. Uh, cities for me are a manifestation of collective intelligence uh, in our societies. And here is an example of uh, how cities work as an, a device for collective intelligence. We know that we learn by imitating other people on the one hand and by trying to be original as compared to other people. Now, if we think about it, both imitation and an attempt to be original both those patterns require very abundant social interactions with other people. I mean, of course, you can imitate other people only when you have any social interaction with those other people. And the more abundant those social interactions are, the more like cognitive material you have uh, for your Im imitation and trying to be original also requires the presence of other humans around. Huh? It, it, it is extremely hard, it is almost impossible to be original when you live just on, on your own in some remote place completely lonely. Huh? Then you can be convinced that you are original, but as a matter of fact you can be very, very typical in your behavior. Uh, another thought, let me calibrate it, yes. Uh, another thought which I sort of, sort of nailed down and which is important for me as for my research methodology, I will talk about it in a moment, is that we humans have the capacity to create certain types of social interactions which work as a, a sort of social machines. Huh? in the sense that those social interactions can become structures. So they can experiment with themselves and they can produce new social structures. Uh, my thought is that social interactions produce and, conven and convey information which our brains need to produce new patterns of social behavior. And by the way, most of our behavioral patterns are social patterns of behavior. And the cities allow that peculiar density of population, that density of social interaction, when our brains receive a particularly high amount of that behavioral, 
social information which serves to form new patterns. Here I try to illustrate it with a different slide. My thought is that not all social interactions have that capacity or to be social machines that pr produce new structures. Some interactions are very in unstable, very volatile. And uh, I think that a society really forms, or we can say that a society really develops uh, when we collectively nail down those specific social interactions which have the capacity to become structures, so which have the capacity to remain stable, structurally stable, whilst experimenting with themselves. And this is exactly what uh, neural networks are. Here I pass to another thread in my research to the fact that I use neural networks to simulate social change. Neural networks are intelligent structures which have the capacity to experiment with themselves. Huh? They are intelligent structures able to experiment with themselves by generating many local idiosyncratic variations and thereby nailing down the variation which minimizes error in achieving a desired outcome. So to this extent, for me, a neural network can be the illustration of like a well-working, well-structured human society. Now another reminder for those of you who have been following uh, my blog for a little longer. Um, I have made, I made uh, like a few updates ago, uh, like a slight turn, a digression towards an important theory in cognitive sciences, the so-called uh, interface theory of perception or ITP. And from that theory, I took an important assumption uh, that uh, when I use an, art an artificial neural network to simulate social change, I implicitly assume that the social change in question is a mark of chain of states. For those of you who are mildly familiar with mathematics, a mark of chain of states is a sequence of sets or a sequence of states where each consecutive state can be derived exclusively from the preceding state without any exogenous divine intervention from outside. And uh, once again, for those of you who are a little bit familiar with uh, neural networks, let me calibrate it a little. OK. Yeah, I think it is OK. Uh, when you make a neural network for simulating anything, the key, th the like the key component or the most fundamental structural trait of that network is the distinction between input variables on the one hand and output variable on the other hand. And this is very much what I mostly do when I use neural networks. Uh, to study social change. My methodology is precisely focused, and you can follow it a little bit in my writing, uh, on an experimental procedure which serves me to show or to find out and show which social traits or which variables informative about a given society are uh, really the desired outcomes we pursue. Hmm? So I take a handful of variables inform informative about a society or a market, and I make as many alternative neural ne uh, uh, networks of that set as there are variables. And each alternative network has the same logical structure, uh, so is made of the same equations in the same sequence, but is pegged on a different variable as its output. And I essentially look for the clone for the network, which is the closest to reality. And I assume that this one with this specific variable 
as its desired outcome is the most representative for the society I am studying. Uh, now I return a little bit to the to cities and the role. I essentially see cities as factories of social roles. I see cities as social machines which produce new social roles for new humans. So essentially cities for me are a social contrivance which we invented thousands of years ago to simply to accommodate long-lasting demographic growth of our human population. And here is an important thing. If you think about it, cities have that peculiar trait that they allow young people to interact a lot with each other. And, it, and cities allow young people to interact uh, without having much interaction with older people. It, uh, it is especially true for teenagers and very young adults, like around the age of 20. And there, uh, there is a, new, a neurophysiological pattern in young people. Essentially, below the age of 25, our decision-making patterns are very different from what we commonly do when we get older. When we are young, uh, our decision-making is much more oriented on short-term rewards and on like a high appetite for risk. And I have an intuition which I try to develop and nail down scientifically that cities allowing an abundant interaction between or among young people allow uh, like a mass production of those specific social roles so those specific jobs businesses and skill sets which are precisely oriented on those trains short-term reward and high appetite for risk and now i pass into my teaching so uh, i ask myself in this update a general question how can i translate uh, those thoughts about cities and so and social structures into teaching and i and for the moment i have like two immediate associations one with my teaching of microeconomics and another one with my teaching of management uh, so my idea first of all is to show to my students in microeconomics how microeconomic models uh, can be translated into social reality and my general thought here uh, is that microeconomics can be seen as a science of how some specific social structures strongly pegged in the social distinction between cities and the countryside reproduce themselves in time as well as produce other social structures and as i pass to management uh, because I teach a lot of fundamentals of management to different majors uh, at the university, I, th I think I can show my students or I can orient that teaching of management towards uh, showing my students how they can constructively compete against each other and cooperate in the same time inside an organization. So as for uh, microeconomics, here in the like in the upper right corner of that slide that you can see like below me in that window, you can see that, that vague sketch of a Marshallian equilibrium. Uh, it is like a, one of the core models of uh, microeconomics. You have those two curves, the curve of demand and the curve of supply. They cross in one single point it is supposed to be the point of equilibrium and uh, I, I usually have hard times to explain to my students how it works huh? because the the hard part is to explain that those curves that they can see uh, in the model they don't really exist but they work huh? what really exists is the equilibrium point so the the idea for teaching that comes to my mind is to take any kind of recurrent social interaction that my students can think of 
and uh, then I would ask my students to decompose that uh, pattern of social interaction into like layers of different consistency. So to separate what is changing and what is volatile on the one hand from what is more permanent and more recurrent on the other hand. And then I would ask them to like couple or connect that consistent recurrent part of that social interaction with the market, with the market equilibrium. I can see how it plays out. Maybe it will be interesting. And now uh, I pass to, to management, to teaching management. Okay, I... It doesn't quite work now. Maybe I will get smaller in that window. Yes, now it works. Uh, so you can see the whole slide. Uh, so I return to that concept of teaching management as a constructive competition. So my idea is that I have been already working for years uh, with my students on the base of annual reports of uh, big, well-known companies like Walt Disney, Boeing, Tesla, Netflix. And I usually teach my students how to find their annual reports, how to surf around in the investors relations sites of those companies. Yet now I have an idea that I can take that uh, uh, each such big business case and their annual reports and uh, try to show my students how can people compete and cooperate, how can they compete more or less constructively or destructively in those specific business environments. This is an interesting idea. I will try to develop on it later on. Okay, that would be all in that up update. I can see that instead of a short editorial, I made a video of more than 20 minutes. So, once again, a reminder, uh, if you go to the description box below the video, you can find the link discoversocialsciences.com. Click on that link and it takes you to the website of my blog, Discover Social Sciences, where you can find an update which has the uh, written update, which has the same title as this video. OK, so as usually, have fun with life and have fun with science. Bye.